Hello and welcome to episode 22 of the Factory Reset Podcast. I've been talking about Jesus' teaching on nonviolence, and this is the second episode on the example of the church in the book of Acts. And now we're going to continue with a focus on the Apostle Paul and his companions in regard to this topic. The episode will focus on two things. So first, I'll consider five stories that Luke records for us in the book of Acts in which Paul and or his friends got themselves into some really dangerous situations. And uh, there's no explicit teaching on nonviolence here, but there is an example to follow that has implications. And then I'd like to talk about how Paul went from being a man who was doing violence to God's people to being a man who would never do violence to anyone. All right, so let's get into these fascinating stories about the Apostle Paul. And here's a question to chew on as we look at Paul's life. Is violence and self-defense consistent with the kind of love and concern for others, coupled with the lack of concern for himself, that we see in Paul's life. Paul had this consuming passion to get as many people saved as he could, and that seemed to override any real concern about what might happen to him. What if we all shared Paul's priorities as a church community, as Christian families? What if we all shared this kind of lack of concern for ourselves due to a consuming concern for other human beings, including our enemies? Or what if we were at least working towards that, trying to grasp that as a community? What place would there be for violence in our lives then? All right, here we go. The first three stories are in Acts chapter 14, 19, and 21. In Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas are in Lystra. God uses Paul to heal a man who had been lame since birth, and the crowd sees this and they think that Barnabas and Paul are Zeus and Hermes, pagan gods, come down in human form. And so the priest of Zeus and Lystra prepares to offer sacrifices to the apostles. And so picking it up from there in verse 14, it says, But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, They tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. Okay, so a few observations. First of all, the genuine concern of the apostles for this misled group of people is very moving. The urgency that they have says something about their compassion that they they rush out into a crowd that's clearly ignorant to shout to them all that they need to turn from their worthless idols. Think about how dangerous that could potentially be, and yet they, they just dive into the crowd with seemingly no concern for themselves. Second, the Jews come from Antioch and Iconium, and they win the crowd over. They turn, they, they turn the crowd against the apostles. And this is interesting. It's one of those little details that's easy to to gloss over. But think about that. These these people, this crowd of people, had just been ready to sacrifice to Barnabas and Paul. 
They're convinced that they're gods because of the miracle that they just witnessed. And so the Jews who came from Antioch and Iconium could not have just like said a couple of words and turned them against the apostles just like that. But it must have taken some amount of time to persuade them. You can't get a crowd to go from worshiping someone to wanting them dead all of a sudden, especially if they just watch the apostles perform this miraculous healing. And so at some point, Barnabas and Paul, who I imagine were probably trying to get the crowd to listen to them instead of the Jews from Antioch and Iconium, at some point they must have realized, hey, this is not looking good. The crowd seems to be turning against us here. This is becoming a dangerous situation. And yet they stick around. Why do the apostles stick around long enough for Paul to get stoned? Why don't they leave before it gets to that point, as they see it going in that direction? That's what many of us would do as soon as it started to look like it could go a certain way. Well, I'm not sure, obviously, but I imagine it was because they continued to try and persuade the people to reason with them, debating with and contending with their enemies, trying to win the crowd to God's side in spite of the danger. And the point is that they, they seem to have this, this deep love and concern for God's glory and for the good of others, and that, that overrides, it overpowers their concern for whether or not they live or die or, or whatever may happen to them. There's another very dangerous situation that arises in Acts 19 in Ephesus. And this is where a silversmith named Demetrius causes a riot over the danger that Paul is to the idol-making business. People are becoming Christians and therefore no longer worshiping idols, and obviously that is greatly concerning to the people who make money off of uh, the idols that they, they create. And so a huge riot breaks out where people rush into the theater in Ephesus, crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, and they go on and on for hours, and they've got Gaius and Aristarchus, who are two of Paul's friends, they basically have them held hostage in the theater. And it says in verses 31, uh, sorry, in verse 30 and 31, but when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, or officials, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Amazing. Imagine there's a really angry mob that's focused primarily on you. A crowd of people who are either really angry at you to the point of rioting, or who just have no idea why they're even there, but they just went along with the, the rest of the crowd, which is also very dangerous. And so what do you do when you find out about that? Well, most of us probably say, okay, let me stay away from that place. Whatever I'm going to do, I'm not going to go in there, because that could be very bad. But not Paul. Paul says, I better get in there, Maybe some of them will listen to me if I preach some more about how they should turn from idols. Or maybe I can get them to put their attention on me rather than on Gaius and Aristarchus. Or something like that. And you attempt to enter the theater completely defenseless. What could move someone to want to do something like that but this incredible love and concern? Love for his friends and also love for the crowd. Paul sees this as an opportunity, right? Like, like, who cares what happens to me? The only reason Paul doesn't go in is because the other disciples restrain him. And so what does that tell you about him? What does that tell you about, about what he might do in, in some of the situations that many of us Christians today arm ourselves for in case they ever happen? One more very dangerous situation is, uh, is found in Acts chapter 21. And this is where Paul 
is spotted in the temple by some of the Jews in Jerusalem who want him dead. Starting in verse 30, it says, The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, Get rid of him! As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. And then he preaches to them and he tells them his testimony, which of course only makes them even more angry. So what's so amazing about this is that Paul had love and concern even for a murderous, rioting crowd of people who want his head on a stick and had just been beating him. And do you realize that these people in Jerusalem, these are some of the people that Paul wrote about in the beginning of Romans chapter 9, whom he had unceasing anguish over. The people that he seems to say he'd be willing to be accursed for. There were times when, when Paul had some really hard things to say to some of the Jews who opposed him or persecuted him. But he clearly also longed for their repentance and he never gave even a hint of being willing to do violence to any of them. I mean, these people just tried to kill him. They were in the process of beating him to death. And yet as soon as he sees the opportunity, he tries to save as many of them as he can. Most of us would just be thinking, okay, please just get me away from these people. And that's because we're missing something. There's, some, there's a disconnect between how Paul thinks and how he sees things and how he understands the gospel and how we think and how we see it, many of us. We're not, we're not on the same page as him. Now, none of those stories say anything explicit about the issue of nonviolence. But try to imagine having this kind of desire for God's message to go out, this kind of concern for other, for other people, this kind of desire for as many people to be saved as possible. And now, Imagine that you and your spouse, if you have one, or, or, or your church community, imagine if this were the kind of love that you were all pursuing together. Would it even occur to you to hire an armed security guard to protect you on Sunday mornings or to, to buy a gun to keep at home just in case? Try to grasp this kind of heart that Paul had, this, this kind of of, of genuine concern for other people, and then try to transport that into some of the situations that we tend to worry about finding ourselves in one day. So back to the classic example that comes up over and over again, and maybe I've brought it up too many times, but you and your kids are in bed, and you hear someone break into the house. What does this kind of love move you to do? What does this kind of lack of concern for yourself and, and consuming compassion for others move you to do? Does it move you to load a gun or to get a bat 
Do you think to yourself, I'd better get ready so I can get this person before they get us? Does that feel like Paul? Or does it move you to perhaps do something like go and confront the intruder, defenseless, and say something like, friend, what are you doing? Please listen to me. Don't you know that the the judgment is coming? Don't you know that God loves you and created you and wants to bless you? And Jesus died to save you from these wicked things that you're doing? Why are you throwing your life away doing these kind of things? Please listen to what I'm saying. Turn from this madness to the living God. No, 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 don't don't leave. Don't leave. Come come sit down. Let me let me talk to you. Let me get you a glass of water. This is my wife. These are my kids. You have no enemies here, my friend. Oh, you want to kill me and my family? Okay, well, listen, you can't do anything to us unless God allows it. And maybe he will allow it, but it doesn't matter because we're ready for what comes after this life. But you're not. And so we're going to preach to you while you do whatever it is you're going to do to us. Or something like that. Of course, there are all kinds of, of other nonviolent ways to respond depending on the situation. Maybe, maybe you know, you just gather everyone into the bedroom and lock the door behind you and go out the window. But it seems that the kind of heart that Paul had would prohibit any kind of violent response. What do you think? How would Paul act in a situation like that? And how would he not act given his example so far? All right, moving on to the next story and shifting gears a little bit. This next story is from chapter 16, and it takes place in Philippi. And what I'm interested in here is how Paul and Silas interpret the events that unfold around them. So they're in Philippi, they're preaching, and there's a slave girl who has a demon, which gives her the ability to predict the future. And this is how her owners earn money through fortune telling. And she's following Paul and his posse around, basically harassing him. And finally, Paul gets really annoyed. He turns and he casts the demon out of her. And then her owners realize that they can't make money off of her anymore. And so they get really mad and they seize Paul and Silas and they take them to the magistrates in Philippi. And so that right there is interesting. It's another one of these things that's easy to read read through and not, not really um, think about what, what the implications are. Because Paul's group consists of at least him, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And whoever else may have converted in Philippi by this time, or whoever else may have been accompanying them from Lydia's household, but there are at, at least, it seems, that there are four grown men in Paul's group here, and these are not wimps. Timothy and Luke and Silas, these are people who are not afraid to die, people who are ready to go through some tough stuff for the gospel. And so how do the owners of the slave girl just seize Paul and Silas and take them wherever they want to take them? Well, it could be that they went and got a few more guys who were armed or something like that and, and simply overpowered them. But the other possibility, and the one that lines up with everything that we've seen in the book of Acts so far, is that Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy were non-resistant. They didn't put up a fight, even though they certainly could have. The second observation is Notice that this is not really religious persecution, not exactly. What I mean is that these slave owners are not angry because of what Paul was preaching. If that were the case, then they might have seized them before they cast the demon out of the slave girl. But they're mad because they've lost their source of income. That's their motivation. That's their, their issue. They do complain that Paul and Silas are Jews teaching things that are unlawful for Romans to accept in order to accuse them. That that's what they say when they bring them before the magistrates. But that's not why they seize them in the first place. It's because of the money. And so it's not quite the same as a situation where 
Paul is being persecuted specifically because of what he believes or what he's preaching. And so I think the, the, the people today who say, well, Christians should only be non-resistant when it comes to religious persecution, but not in other contexts, I think that if they were in a situation like this, they might have a hard time figuring out what category to put this in. You know, do we do we practice non-resistance here? Is this religious persecution? Or, or you know, is it not really in that category? Because these guys really just care about the money. That That's all this is really about. They don't care about what we're actually saying. And so there might be a little bit of a dilemma there. You know, what do we do in this situation? What category do we put this in? But I don't think Paul would ever have that dilemma because he would be nonviolent in every context. All right, now picking it up in verse 22. This is just after Paul and Silas have been accused before the magistrates. It says, The town joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Obviously, there's a lot that is amazing about this story. But what I find particularly interesting for the purpose of this episode is how Paul and Silas interpret the miraculous event that takes place in the jail. There's an earthquake all the prison doors fly open, all the chains fall off. What does this mean? Obviously, God is doing this. Obviously, God is, is creating an opportunity for Paul and Silas. But an opportunity for what? Is it an opportunity to escape? Is it retribution against the jailer? Should, should Paul and Silas... You know, watch him as he kills himself, and this is punishment from God. Is, is it, is it a, an opportunity to overpower the jailer and knock him out and get away? Has God done this amazing thing so that they can get out of this incredibly unjust situation? I mean, none of those things would be unreasonable for, you know, someone who's just reading the book of Acts for the first time to conclude right after what's just happened to them. And, and imagine that you're reading the book of Acts, and it's the first time that you're reading it. And you come to this passage, and you don't know what happens next, right? They, they, they just took this awful, severe beating, and then the earthquake happens, and the doors fly open, the chains fall off, and then you stop reading. And then you try to guess what happens next. What would you guess Paul and Silas are about to do? How do you interpret that miraculous event? What is God up to? What is he intending? Well, Paul and Silas interpret this miraculous event not as an opportunity to improve their situation, but as an opportunity to show mercy to the jailer who put them in prison. Paul sees it as an opportunity for the salvation of this man 
who participated in the unjust treatment, even though he was just following orders, but nevertheless participating. And so consider the way Paul and Silas see the world around them. They see everything as an opportunity for the gospel, and they seem almost oblivious to their own well-being. And they're always looking for an opening to save someone. And if they survive, great. If they suffer and die, even better, just as long as they can get someone saved. And so, now suppose, you know, take, take that way of seeing the world, that way of thinking about things, and, and suppose someone approaches you and your family on the street with a gun. How do you interpret that if you're thinking about things the way Paul does? What, what is this an opportunity for? Is it an opportunity to, to use your, your MMA moves, your self-defense moves? Is it, is it time to try and you know, get, get, the, get the crook to look in the other direction so that you can get your hands on the gun and try to wrestle them to the floor and put them in an arm bar? And if someone ends up dying in the process, hopefully it's them and not you, in which case they go to hell. But just as long as you and your family are okay, is that what you're thinking? Is that how someone like Paul would interpret that event? Is that the opportunity that he would be looking for? Or, if you think about things like Paul and Silas, do you and your family interpret this as an opportunity for the gospel? Are you ready to suffer or even die, seizing this as an opportunity to show this person and whoever may be observing, including your family members, what the love of Christ looks like. What lens are we wearing through which we will interpret events like these if they happen to us? Okay, moving on with the passage in verse 35. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. So clearly, non-resistance, non-violence, and love for enemies does not mean that you're always polite and gentle. It does not mean that you never have serious words for someone or that you never confront people, that you never hold their feet to the fire. Of course you do. And Paul responds very differently to, to the magistrates than he does to the jailer. Perhaps Paul and, and Silas sensed something in the jailer that they didn't see in the magistrates. Maybe the, the jailer seemed to have an openness and a humility about him while the magistrates seem to be proud and hard-hearted and closed. But even with the magistrates, we see Paul practicing non-resistance. He doesn't get them in trouble for what they've done, even though he could, ha he could have. He could have made life very bad for those guys if he had wanted to. But instead, he puts them on the hot seat. He gives them a good scare, probably for their own good. And they've probably already heard the gospel. They know what they're preaching. And then he moves on. All right, one more story. And this is in Acts chapter 23. And Paul is now being held in Jerusalem. This is after the crowd of people tried to kill him outside of the temple, which we talked about earlier. And after that in incident, Paul is about to be interrogated by flogging uh, by the Romans because they want answers about who he is and what the uproar in Jerusalem was all about. But then he asked the Romans if it's lawful to flog a Roman citizen who has not been found guilty 
and they realize he's a Roman citizen, they back off. So Paul's not interested in suffering for just no reason, you know, just because these guys are confused about who he is. He did not object to being beaten without being found guilty back in, in Philippi. And maybe that's because he had been accused to the magistrates by the slave owners of teaching things that are unlawful for Romans to accept and believe, which is true. He's teaching that Jesus is Lord and that they should not worship idols and things like that. He was doing that. But here in Jerusalem, it would basically be a beating for no reason other than that the Romans just don't know who he is and they're confused and they want answers. And so it shows that he doesn't have this weird desire to suffer needlessly. Anyway, the part of the story that I want to focus in on is what happens a little later on, starting in Acts 23, verse 12. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside, and asked, What is it you want to tell me? He said, Some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them, because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning, Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, Get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen, and go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. And then Paul is transferred to Caesarea. Very, very interesting passage. And some people might use this passage to show that it's okay for Christians to call the cops if some crime is about to take place or if someone is threatening us. And I would say it's not a straightforward thing. And we need to learn from Paul's wisdom and his apparent motivation here. Why does Paul inform the commander of the plot on his life? What is his motivation? Does Paul inform the authorities because he wants to make sure nothing happens to him? Because he, he, he wants the Romans to use the sword to protect him? Is that, is that the motivation there? I don't think he tells the commander about the plot on his life because he's concerned for his well-being and he's hoping that these guys will use their weapons to make sure nothing happens to him. It doesn't fit with the rest of what we see in Paul's life. So then what is his motivation? Well, think about what will happen if Paul does not inform the authorities. At some point, there's going to be an attempt on his life. right? Paul, Paul's being escorted by the soldiers to appear before the Sanhedrin. And then all of a sudden, over 40 guys ambush them. And what's the result? It's probably a bunch of dead or seriously hurt people on both sides. And so Paul's decision to tell the commander about the plot actually avoids violence. It does not cause violence. It does not cause the death or imprisonment of his enemies or of the Romans. It actually avoids it. 
But consider this. What if things had been different? What if it was the opposite? Here's what I mean. In this situation, notifying the authorities kept violence and death from occurring. But what if the situation were such that notifying the authorities would have saved Paul's life, but most likely would have caused violence and or the death of others? Would he notify them in that case? So suppose Paul and Priscilla and Aquila are together, let's say, with a, a, a few other brothers and sisters who have some young kids with them, and they're under some serious, terrible threat, and they're likely going to be attacked. But in this situation, they know that if they call the authorities, it may save their lives, but it could very well result in casualties for both their enemies and for whatever soldiers come to their aid. And they know what death for these people will mean, eternal darkness. And so what do you think they would do in a situation like that? Would they call the authorities and, and ask them to do for them what they are unwilling to do for themselves and, 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 and ask them to use violence to protect them? Or would they just be sheep among wolves? Would they pray to God, let the situation unfold however it does, get out of the area if they can, as Paul often did, respond to their enemies with the love of Jesus, and leave the outcome in God's hands? Well, I think that that's an easy one. We know what they do from these stories and acts. And I don't think they would call the authorities in a situation like that. And I don't think we should call the authorities to protect us either, us meaning Christians. I think a harder question is if we should ever call the authorities if we know that someone else who is not a believer is in some kind of real danger, some kind of threat of attack, or worse, a big group of people who are not believers. And uh, I... I, I that, that's a complicated thing, and I, I hope to get into that a bit more in the episode on Romans 13. But should a Christian ever call the cops? I think the answer is, it depends. In many situations, I think the answer is clearly no. Doing so would be asking others to do for us what we refuse to do because of our obedience to Jesus. And it would not be an act of love for our enemies. It would be an act of self-preservation and it could potentially put the lives of both our enemies and the police who would come to our aid in jeopardy. In other situations that may be more like the situation in Acts 23, yes, it makes sense to call the cops. Maybe doing so would help to avoid bloodshed. It would, it would prevent a violent situation or crime from, from even happening. In some situations, it may be complicated, and we're going to need to rely on wisdom from God. We're going to have to get a handle on some principles that can guide us in situations when the answer may not be clear, and I do not claim to have all that figured out. Okay, so we have seen now that Paul had something profound going on inside of him, and a lot more could be said about the love that he had for people as revealed in his actions, the effort that he put into evangelism, speaking with and reasoning with people and arguing with people every day in the synagogues, in the marketplace, or how Paul once just skipped a night of sleep and went on and on and on teaching the brothers and sisters in Troas until daybreak, and how from the time he was converted, he over and over again put himself in harm's way for the chance to get someone, anyone, to come into God's kingdom. And so what in the world produced this kind of love in the heart of the Apostle Paul? How did he get to this place? Well, as you probably know, Paul had been a Pharisee who had devoted his entire life to God as best as he knew. And he unknowingly devoted himself to destroying the people of God, the servants of the Messiah. And he tells us some of what he did in his speech to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. He says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. So think about what he was doing. I know we've heard this story many, many times, but think about that. Hunting down God's people, putting them behind bars, and then voting for them to be executed, trying to force them to blaspheme. Can you imagine? I wonder if he ever succeeded in that with any of them. Getting Christians to blaspheme. And then one day he's on his way to Damascus to continue destroying or trying to destroy the church of God. And a light from heaven shines around him. And he falls to the ground and he hears a voice ask him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And I don't know. But I imagine it must have at least been dawning on him when he saw that light and when he heard those words that maybe he had been wrong. And he asks, Who are you, Lord? And I can imagine he may have been thinking to himself, Please don't say Jesus of Nazareth. But of course the voice says, Jesus of Nazareth. No clue what Paul was thinking then, but I imagine it might have been something like what Isaiah thought when he realized that he had just seen the Lord, only this was worse. Like, okay, this is the end for me, obviously. I'm surely going to die. I thought I was one of the good guys. I know now I was really one of the bad guys, maybe the worst. This is surely retribution that's about to take place for what I've done. I am now going to die. I'm going to go to Sheol. It's over. Here it comes. But instead, he hears, Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and what you will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Probably not what Saul was expecting to hear. And can you imagine what must have been going through Saul's head over the course of the next three days as he sat in the dark, unable to see, thinking over what had just happened? Why didn't he kill me? He didn't do to me what I had been doing to his people. I had them killed. I tried to make them blaspheme. And now he's going to let me be one of his servants? He's sending me to preach his message? And then in comes Ananias, one of the people that Saul was on his way to Damascus to hunt down and potentially send to his death. But in spite of that, Ananias lays his hands on him and says, Brother Saul. Brother Saul? Brother? I was going to try to destroy this man and he calls me brother? Jesus said, Whoever is forgiven much loves much. And Paul is a great example of that. And clearly being forgiven much by God does not only result in much love for God, it has implications for our love for our neighbors, including our enemies, since we had been God's enemy. The grace and mercy that Paul received from the Lord, in spite of the violence he had done to the church, transformed Paul into a sheep, a lamb, who would never again be any physical threat to anyone. And that's the end of this discussion on the book of Acts. The church set us an example to follow. They were under constant threat at times. But they preached, they prayed, they warned, they scattered, they suffered, they died. They did not take up arms. 
And so if we want to be people who would have been welcomed by that church, who would have fit in among those believers, who would have been embraced by the apostles as true disciples, then we need to make sure that that pattern we see in them is present in our lives and our communities as well. Thank you so much for listening. In the next episode, I plan to address a number of passages in the Bible, particularly the New Testament, that people sometimes try to use to make a case for just war theory or for Christians using violence and self-defense. May God bless you, and may he help us all to pursue the kind of heart that drove Paul to live as he did. And may God help us to get as many people, friends or enemies, into his kingdom before our time is over or before Jesus returns. And please let me know if you would like to.